Good afternoon. What a wonderful day. I learned so much. I have to say that last presentation, from the last presentation to the first presentation, has been hats off to um, Municipal Arts Society and uh, New Yorkers for Parks. Great summit. I've learned a lot, and we're going to learn a little bit more here. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Liz Thomas. Um, Liz is truly an amazing person. Um, she is a professional hiker, she's an adventure com uh, conservationist, and she's an author. Um, from Pasadena to the South Bronx, Liz has designed and walked 13 urban hiking areas and cities across the country. Um, I had the honor of working with Liz when she came to New York City and walked over 200 miles um, through all five boroughs, and she did this um, uh, in just nine days. Think about that. So if you have a week of time, maybe you can walk 225 miles to be precise. Um, and she linked together half of our playground, that's 103 playgrounds that we've built in all five boroughs at the Trust for Public Land. And, and Liz really helped publicize the work we did. Um, I'm sure that is, uh, she's seen more of New York than maybe everybody in this room or most people in this room. So if you have questions, I will be from time to time, and I'll do my best to integrate this, um, looking at the questions, so please do um, submit them and I will fold them into our conversation. Um, and here's the uh, instructions right there. Um, so Liz is fresh from hiking uh, 1,000 miles, uh, just a little jaunt on the Pacific Crest Trail. She's done a through hike before on, on all of the major trails, including she's the, um, held the record for a good six years on the Appalachian Trail. She walked for 80 days averaging 26 miles a day. So think about that. A marathon every day for 80 mile days in a row. Um, Liz, how do you feel? It's been a, you know, 35 days on the trail. Um, what was that like? Uh, I, I feel really great. I think there's something about walking and particularly spending that much time in nature that's good for clearing one's mind, uh, giving space to reflect on things that are going on in life, my relationship with nature. So I, I feel fantastic. Well, this is a wonderful picture, and actually it's been on my um, bucket list for a long time, but I thought I'd um, hearken back to a great conservationist, John Muir, and he had this to say about, um, in his book, The Yosemite, written in 1912, and to tie it back to our theme of light, he said, at my feet lay the great Central Valley of California, level and flowery, like a lake of pure sunshine. And from the eastern boundary of this vast golden flower bed rose the mighty Sierra, miles in height, and so gloriously colored and so radiant, it seemed not clothed with light, but wholly composed of it, like a wall of some celestial city. Then it seemed to me that the Sierra should be called not the Nevada or Snowy Range, but the range of light. Um, so, you know, light uh, is certainly a theme when, when uh, in these pictures we see. Um, how does that affect, you've been, uh, done a lot of rural hikes, long distance hikes. Um, how does the Sierras stand out and its reputation for, uh, for light and shadow? Uh, how does that affect the experience? Yeah, uh, you know, one of the great things about the Sierra is not just that there's so much brightness, but it's how it reflects on lakes and how it reflects off of rocks uh, and, and how that light boosts your mood, not to mention helps with your photos <laughs> being bright enough. Uh, and I think that sort of reflection, not just from the sky, but from the area around you is, is what makes the Sierra so magical. Well, you, um, of course, there's the Sierras, and these pictures are amazing, the quality of the rock and, and the light. Um, it, it seems like you can see for miles. Um, but of course, you're here in New York City. Um, and actually, for me, as a, I'm a Syracuse native, and if folks don't know that town, it has over 200 cloudy days a year. So I think of New York City as just a sun-drenched place believe it or not. Um, but you have um, done urban hikes in LA, of course, your hometown, Seattle, Portland, um, Tucson, uh, Chicago, Grand Rapids, Denver, um, probably Montgomery, of course, the historic walk there. Um, what led you to think of and create this field of urban hiking? So I came into urban hiking kind of as a dare. There, there's some very active community groups, um, very localized in certain cities that do urban day hikes. But as far as this sort of taking a through hike, a backpacking multi-day, multi-week in some cases, uh, backpacking trip all within a city, uh, I came upon it as a, as a dare. Um, an individual who had been planning on hiking the John Muir Trail, which goes through the Sierra, uh, was tired of 
driving or having to figure out a way to get up into the mountains to train. So started taking it to the city, uh, looking at similar mileage uh, training hikes within the city and similar elevation gain going up stairways. And then said, hey, I can put together a 214 mile, uh, I don't know, 35,000 feet elevation gain hike, kind of like the John Muir Trail, statistically, uh, physically speaking, uh, all within a city. And I came out um, thinking, oh, well, at least I'll get some training in, I'll get my miles in this week, uh, and actually really fell in love with it. And, and what stood out? I mean, it's certainly the mileage and the physical aspects you could mirror, but I, I know one thing with um, the extreme hiking that you do is uh, managing thermal comfort, something we heard about this morning, um, you know, from the sunny side of the Sierras to the, to the uh, shady side. Of course, it's a huge temperature gradient. You get snowstorms in the summer. What was it like in L.A., which we think of as always temperate, in the summer? Were, were there thermal gradient differences that you noticed? Yeah, I think, you know, this morning we, we heard talks about the uh, heat island effect, and that is definitely something that can be as severe in a city walking through it as if I was going from 5,000 feet to 10,000 feet in a more mountainous environment. And the weird thing is that I'll be in a f relatively flat area, and to have that sort of temperature change uh, within miles is, is really something to experience. <laughs> Have you noticed, of course, your, your native land is California, um, and um, you know, we, we've seen some fires this week, and how has climate change, and this is an audience question, I say, so thank you for that question, um, how have you noticed the impacts of climate change in your hikes over time, and, and how does that affect your approach to both um, the long distance hiking you do and the urban long distance hiking? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, at least with more wilderness long distance hikes, when I first started doing this uh, about 15 years ago, it was quite possible to hike uh, 2,000 miles, 3,000 miles in one season on one of these long Mexico to Canada routes without having any trail closures for wildfires, and now that's pretty much impossible. Uh, it's never a given that you're gonna be able to walk the whole route. Um, same thing with huge um, deviations between snow years. Um, going through snowy mountains is a, a really difficult part of any of these mountain hikes, and you can get a very low snow year, or you can get a huge snow year, and it's, it's these huge variations that uh, are, are likely related to climate change. It, it sounds like um, you know, part of it is the unpredictability, of course, of, of climate change. And I, I will point out that um, we think of fires as a California thing, um, even when the power is off or kind of off, um, unfortunately, or there aren't trains. But um, in September, we had a very dry September and October. Um, I kind of pay attention to, to water issues. And we had, in the Hudson Valley, 10 fires happening, 10 wildfires happening at the same time. So it can come here, and that's basically on the heels of a very wet June, for those of you who are gardeners know. Um, so uh, wild swings just in this year. Um, well. Uh, you know, I'd like to talk about, before we get to New York City, the place we know and love, of course, and your, and your experience here, um, can, when we've spoken, you, you've mentioned sort of the um, effects of the, in this day and age of the walking speed and how that changes your perspective of the world. And can, um, can you elaborate on that and, and describe sort of in the, in the various cities and urban hikes you've done, um, what differences you've been able to observe at that walking speed um, in those cities? Yeah, definitely. So that, that's one of the things that I love about urban hiking is even though I have the speed record on the Appalachian Trail, I'm still going three miles per hour. So, so not anywhere near the speed that I would have on a car or a bike. Uh, and at that speed of three miles per hour, whether I'm in a natural environment or within a city, it gives time to really process what I'm seeing, reflect on the communities I'm walking. And in particular, for all of the urban hikes that I've done, I have uh, try to come up with a theme that I'm connecting on foot. So here in New York, it was the playgrounds, but uh, in LA, it was stairways. Uh, in Denver, I connected breweries on foot. <laughs> so uh, it, it really gives time to think about how each of these individual places are a reflection of their community, how they function within their community, and more importantly, how people who live near that resource, whatever it is, interacts with that resource. 
So do you see, um, I'm sure in Seattle, by the way, you were connecting coffee shops and, you know, I don't know how you, did you limit your coffee, caffeine intake or you double up on it when you're urban hiking? Uh, that, that one had quite a bit of coffee. It had a, it had a stairway theme though. Okay. So we needed the caffeine. Um, uh, in terms of trail communities, because when, when we think about trails, we often think about trail communities. Um, of course, the, there's a very hardcore element of Appalachian through hikers or um, section hikers, which are kind of considered to be maybe one step below. But oh, no, there's still people, too. That, um, but for urban, the urban hiking community, does it exist yet? Is it evolving? What, what observations can you say in some of those other cities? I think it's definitely evolving. Uh, I've seen it happen. Um, you know, it, the LA community is the one that invited me to come out um, for, the, for my first urban hike. And uh, they were almost created as a reaction against everything that LA is with car culture. But I see more and more cities uh, looking at urban hiking as a way to explore the sort of funky, uh, fun things that are in there, kind of like the sort of like secrets that you only tell your friends about like, hey, look around this corner. Um, and create routes that are really uh, fun and exploratory in the same way that going out in nature uh, also lets you have that experience. Have you, um, between these cities, here we are on the beer tour, that looks like a good round, and uh, I think this might be Prospect yeah, Park, that's actually. Prospect We've Park. got a New York City Playground shirt on, so um, uh, this is great. And I guess it's prompting me to say, let's look about New York City, the quality of light that we're seeing in this photo, of course, Prospect Park, one of the great parks in the world. Um, how did that compare in your, in your view to other cities? Yeah, I mean, the thing that, that really blew me away about the, the New York hike was connecting to the playgrounds and seeing how the communities near the playgrounds interacted with their park because, uh, because of the great thing that Trust for Public Land does where the students as part of their science classes uh, sit, sit down and design their parks uh, based on what they want. Um, seeing that sort of very, the equity across all of the parks, in, across the five boroughs, was what really touched me. Um, some of my friends who came along and hiked for a while was like, this park looked just like the last one. But having walked to all of them, I can see that there's similarities, uh, the equity-wise, but the things that make them different, um, what the kids specifically requested, is, is really what touched me. So what Liz is referring to is the fact that we have a system and there's a table upstairs if you're interested in learning more about it, something called participatory design and we work with school children to um, design playgrounds and part of that curriculum involves um, sun and shade analysis. So we need to know, for example, where to plant the gardens. Um, it seems um, intuitive to gardeners but it's not obvious to everybody and I have to say it's not obvious to the original designers of some of these schoolyards because I can tell you PS 19 in the East Village um, the, the uh, garden was in the wrong place and so now it's in the right place and we're involving kids in, in, in not only the designing of it and location but also uh, in growing plants and harvesting vegetables and the like. Um, well to go Here's a question I have uh, that um, speaks to not just the quality of light, but sort of a borough competition. But um, you talked about equity, but was one borough the, the toughest to hike? Uh, was it the hills of the Bronx? Was it the vast distances in Queens? I would say one of the things that, that was the hardest was the vast distances in Queens between parks. And especially in that sense, getting to a playground, it, it felt like I was like swimming or something, and then I got to an island of, of, of green, an island of people from the community gathering around. Um, and and uh, yeah, and it, it was warmer in those areas. It was noticeably warmer um, in those areas as well. Um, did you happen to notice a, a lot of fellow walkers in the city? Of course, people come visit New York, of course, remark on the fact that, oh, I'm not going from my door to my car to my you know, to the driveway to my workplace and back and walking maybe 100 steps, you really can get your 10,000 steps in in New York in a, in a normal day. Um, we happened to meet someone um, who's a fellow through hiker who walks eight miles to work and eight miles back every single day through Prospect Park, which is incredible. And I think her trail name is Woodchuck. And she, um, she really talked about how wonderful it was to get to her job as a designer in Midtown, so it's a lovely job to begin with, but 
having gone through this experience every day. And can you talk about the, um, you know, the, back to the urban hiking communities, what hiking through this light means to them on, the, on a daily basis? Yeah, I, I think, um, as, as we heard in the talk before, having cortisol levels, I mean, there's definitely a lot of science and, and physiological changes that happen being um, not just in nature, but being exposed to that light, um, especially early in the morning before you start working. Um, but I think, I, I think one of the reasons why I like urban hiking is it's a little crazy. It, uh, people, I, I think there's something in the DNA of humans to walk for a very long time. And so it's been a way to um, talk about, to, to be an advocate for urban planning, for healthy living, for livable communities in a way that is a little more, um, it, there, there's a kind of a fun, funky connection, sporty connection between it. Um, and I, I think that people like that idea of like, hey, maybe I could have this sort of experience before my day of work. Um, we, um, you know, we often think of light as important to safety, um, particularly in urban areas, frankly, um, everywhere. Um, and uh, your feeling of um, security, you're walking alone for most of it. We tried to keep up with you, but we couldn't. <laughs> um, walking through New York City, was there a place where you felt like, oh, I wish there's a little bit more light in this place or in, in another city? Yeah, I mean, the area that I met you um, by PS19, that, that area is among the most dense. Um, and I, I could tell a difference. And strategically, while I was putting together my route, I tried to go along places, paths that had more light, um, which often happened to be the greenways, but not always, um, so that I could have, um, have as natural an experience as I could. Um, so an audience member wants to know, um, how would you get more New Yorkers to interact more with their urban wild spaces? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I think part of it is um, it's not so, I mean, New Yorkers are great walkers. In fact, this is the first city where I've had difficulty keeping up with the locals, <laughs> even though I have a speed record. Um, but I think it's not just the walking, it's not just being outdoors, it is also taking that same sort of exploratory mindset and, uh, and thinking a lot about where you are, your relationship to the place, um, and being observant in the same way that you would on a hike in a natural area, in a national park. Uh, even if, so one thing I would say is to, to get out more, part of it's to not just do the same route you use for your commute. Um, choose a place you haven't been before and uh, let that be a guide to exploring. Do you think we need challenges? I mean, uh, I will say that, um, you know, when I'm walking in Brooklyn, sometimes it's like, let's go to Roberta's, which is pretty far in there to get some pizza. Um, you know, do you think that the, having those challenges is a, is a good motivating factor? And, uh, and if so, um, do you think that anybody can replicate your, your uh, New York City hike? Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the, the human mind loves to check things off. They love to have a clear destination. I, I think that's one of the definitions, and there's a lot of philosophy behind this, um, that makes a hike different from a ramble or a wander uh, is having that clear destination at the end point. So instead of a peak, it's Roberta's for pizza. Um, I, ran, I uh, hiked with an ultra run in Seattle who would pick different pastry shops <laughs> and keep that as, as a motivation. Um, <laughs> I guess that's one of the great things is they can uh, burn it off so you can eat as much as possible. Um, let's talk about the street life and street food in New York. Uh, how does it stand up to other cities? Oh, it was fantastic. What was your favorite? Um, I had some great pizza in Brooklyn, uh, bagels. Uh, Did you go to Arthur Avenue in the Bronx? Italian food? Oh, no, I didn't. Oh, so we, well, we, I think there's a culinary. I, mean, I think uh, out of this conference, we might get a culinary food walk. Um, <laughs> well, I, um, so there's a question about urban wildlife. Um, did you see any urban wildlife? Um, I want to ask about the, the sightings of New York City alligators. Um, not quite a myth, but not, not <laughs> above ground, certainly. But um, what did you notice about the, about the natural world when you did string together those, those parks? Yeah. Um, 
it, it really made me wish I was more of a birder <laughs> because I saw quite a few birds. And I did see a woodchuck in the Bronx, which I was not expecting. Um, that was pretty exciting. Um, actually, I saw three of them. Liz was here for those. And I know the um, uh, American Bird Society is here tonight. She was hiking in May, of course, or part of the warbler migration. Um, and uh, Central Park, Prospect Park, uh, are part of the Atlantic Flyway. It's a wonderful time to be in New York and to be a birder. So uh, whether you know it or not, even a non-birder like me um, can be impressed and notice that there's a, an uptick. Um, well, we see some elevated spaces um, here. For example, you're, you're walking on. Um, can you speak about that? Um, you know, there, there were some areas where you're at ground level, some areas where you're above ground level. Did that change the, the quality of light experience for you and, and what you felt being at eye level with some of the, the leaves in this case where the, uh, they're almost glowing green with uh, captured light and chlorophyll? Um, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I, there's several things that make it really fun. It's fun to be perched above the city. It feels very much so like being on a cliff on a mountain, a peak. Um, but I think having that, that light also makes it feel very much so like being in, being in a mountain, being in a, a national park, that sort of experience. Um, I will say the, the corollary to this is uh, Chicago, which has a lot of, um, a lot of uh, I guess, tunnels almost that, that as a pedestrian you have to walk through in order to connect over. And um, especially when I was going through those areas at night, it will, could, could be a little scary uh, by myself. Um, so to have this, these sort of elevated uh, areas, um, I, I think being able to perch almost like a bird uh, made me feel safer. It's interesting. I mean, I, I was, um, our, our prior speaker spoke about bi biophilia and taking down some of those overpasses, I think, is long overdue. Um, certainly, the, some of the notorious overpasses, like up by Columbia um, uh, and other places, are fine on top, but below it's not so great. And I think, of course, if folks have been to Newark, I trust Republic Land has an office in Newark, and I spent some time there. Um, famously, that created kind of a habit trail of above ground. Light-filled structure, sure, but underneath um, is very dark, and it just doesn't, there's no urban life um, uh, happening. Um, can you speak a little bit comparatively, again, New Yorkers are being competitive, some in the audience at <laughs> least, but um, about stewardship and the care of the public realm from city to city. So did it feel um, like some parks and some boroughs were, were in better shape than others? Um, and just overall, your impressions of New York City versus uh, you know, a place like Seattle. Yeah, I mean, New York City is by far the best walking city. Um, it, the, it, it was a great experience to walk through here. Uh, the infrastructure is set up really nicely for people on foot, which makes a lot of sense. Um, it felt very safe um, being around drivers. Um, as far as the upkeep goes in different boroughs, um, specifically, I could tell that some boroughs um, seem to have more funding for their parks than other boroughs. Um, and I've been able to talk to people who work in parks a little bit about some of the reasons behind it. I'm sure there's lots of you who, who know that much better than, know that very intimately. Um, but I would say that it, it was clear that people were using their parks and loving their parks regardless of what borough they were in and what community they were in. And that was something that uh, I really looked forward to being there in the afternoon and on the weekends when I would see grandmas and grandpas and families and teenagers all hanging out in the same space, enjoying their park. It's, it's certainly, if, you know, those public realm spaces where we can all mix is something our, our society needs right now, frankly. Uh, we need to meet people who aren't like us. Um, and it only happens in the streets and on the subway, frankly. So it um, doesn't happen in schools, sad to say. And so we do need those public realm places. Um, my, uh, my last question to you is, um, you know, your observations of um, urban design and urban living. How is, how is um, urban hiking and walking, get, again, going through at three miles an hour, changed your view of um, or informed your view of urban design and what you think would make for a great city? Yeah, I think um, 
that, that, that experience of walking through different cities has made me think a lot about quality of life. And when you're on the street, what would it be like to live in this neighborhood, to live near this park, to live near this playground, uh, and really observe the people and how they're interacting with their parks? Uh, I, I think walking is a way to connect to oneself, but walking is also a way to connect to the landscape around you. And, and that, that's what I love about urban hiking. Well, thank you, Liz. And I do want to put in a plug for Jane's Walks. Um, of course, the Municipal Arts Society um, has uh, a great program. Sign up for it. Learn about the city at a walking pace with an expert guide that varies over time. Um, and you, too, can, can have this experience. So um, please join me in thanking Liz for coming to New York City. Thank you so much for having me, Carter.